This episode is brought to you by Indie Insights. Indie Insights is our bi-weekly newsletter and love note to the film industry, movies, and the creatives that make them, not to mention you, our esteemed listeners. Inside, you'll find curated industry trends, articles, exclusive commentary, and underappreciated films from filmmakers like you worldwide. And the best part is that it is completely free. So join today at www.bonsai.film. It takes just a few seconds. And once you sign up, you'll get the very next newsletter on Friday morning. It's that simple. Go to www.bonsai.film to get Indie Insights, our biweekly newsletter, and join a network of film creatives just like yourself. And don't worry, we'll never sell your information or spam you with a bunch of nonsense emails, just the bi-weekly film industry goodness you need. And if you ever tire of Indie Insights, simply unsubscribe. No gimmicks, no games. So go to www.bonsai.film to get Indie Insights for free. listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps creatives in film get where they're going faster by sharing the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives across the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley, and with me today is my good friend and Make It podcast co-host, Nicholas Bugs. Hello, hello. Chris here with another episode of the Make It Podcast, and this is an Indie Talk week, and that means I have my co-founder and good friend, Nicholas Bugs, back yes, sir. in the building, back in the house after a short hiatus. Nick, say hello. Hello, hello. What's up, folks? Good to be back. What's up, Chrissy? Do you want to defend your triple aloha? When Matt sat in for you uh, in the last Indie Talk, he noticed that you gave a triple aloha. And we talked about why that was problematic, of course. Um, And I just didn't know if you wanted to defend why one would wear a hat and shirt that both say aloha in a picture and then give the pinky thumb, which means aloha. So that's your third aloha. We tried to see if you had a quadruple aloha, which would have taken it over the top. You might not have been able to come back to the show because we thought it said aloha in your sunglasses in the corner. It did not. Oh, it it didn't. Uh, Uh, But can you defend? Because we were concerned. We talked about this for five or 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. uh, As you might know already. uh, Can you defend your triple aloha? Oh, of course. Of course. You know, so the first aloha was the shirt aloha. Yes. Okay. The second aloha was the hat that actually belonged to my wife. Okay. And because it was so hot out there, she was like, you should wear the hat. So I was like, okay, because I had my own hat. And she was like, you should wear the hat. So I wore the hat. Now, the triple, now this doesn't actually, in this one, I'm (laughs) saying it's shaka, doesn't mean aloha. Okay, that's the shaka. That's what that is. (laughs) Not the shocker. Okay, yeah. it well, is the shaka. Wait, when you do the shaka, do you <laughs> right, use the right same now. fingers? <laughs> right, no, see, no. Shaka uh-huh. does not mean aloha. Now, I will tell you this. Let it's me see. Let me likely. think about these finger situations. No, no, let's, let's not think about the fingers. Yeah, this could get gross. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I was all Hawaii'd out, bro. Like, <laughs> it was so, great. Yeah, it, it's kind of, we, we, we said it was like akin to when a guy buys a Mercedes and then wears a Mercedes hat everywhere. Mercedes you know? hat. Yeah, like, yeah, you were yeah. so proud of your Hawaiian trip that you, uh, the, your normal wardrobe would no longer suffice. <laughs> right. The things you wear, like, it would be like if you walked around Maryland every day and D.C. every day just wearing, like, uh, like Maryland and D.C. gear. And yeah, you got, like, like the, t- the tour- commanders. Yeah, Tourism <laughs> Maryland. Or, like, right. whatever Maryland's known for, like, 
lakes and, and, and rivers in the Potomac or whatever. Potomac. <laughs> the Potomac. Yeah. But the thing is, again, the, the hat wasn't actually initially intentional. My wife gave it to me because it was so sunny out there. She was like, here, put this on. You didn't bring your hat down. Wear this. So I was like, oh, look at that. I got a double aloha. So I had to, <laughs> had to drop the shocker because you're in Hawaii, dude. Like, it is what it is. <laughs> look at that. I have a double aloha. I, I think That's this, right. Look, you should not be taking a hat when you have the melon and you have. Bro, I'm just telling you, though. You have the I melon don't, I don't have the hair on mm-hmm. top of the head, so I need to make sure that I don't get too much sun on the dome, right? Yeah. yeah. I started thinking about that, you know, especially you get older, you're like, you know what? I don't need skin cancer, bro. It's not a thing I want. Yeah, I got melanin, but it ain't gonna protect you from everything. So, you know, you get out there, you swim, no hat, you're good. But if you're just sitting out there, you gotta have something to cover your cover your dome. Your yeah. domicile. For those who <laughs> won't ever get to see this, Nick doesn't have any hair. By yeah. <laughs> a little bit, well, me, it's, a, man. It's, a, it's a little bit by choice, right? Oh yeah, it's, it's a little bit by choice. So it's like a half and halfer. It's like it's like you don't want to like. What was George Jefferson thinking? <laughs> I knew you were gonna say it. I knew it. I knew like, it. Like, like, why did why, why didn't Phil why didn't Weezy while, why didn't Weezy ever tell him? Hey man, go ahead. And, yeah, what about Uncle Phil? Uncle go Phil, ahead and bro, cut the rest you know, of that off. Get all that stuff on Vivian, the side. Vivian, where you at? Vivian, yep. Vivian should have told Uncle yep. Phil. I think though that it was a look, bro. I think though he was a judge, so he needed that for authoritative legitimacy. Well, and it's the thing. It was a look. Yeah, right. I, I mean, it says I'm educated. I'm, I'm an authority on. I'm, I'm an academic. I'm, I'm judging you. I'm fair. I'm fair because I have yeah. a little hair. Right, because <laughs> if you cut your hair off now, you're kind of a prima donna. You care about how you uh, look. You care about your. Oh image. wow! Listen, to, you can't listen be to that, guys. You can't be impartial. <laughs> So he's Nick, telling me about myself, right? He's yeah, like, you can't be a judge. Nick. You're, hey, you're you in film for a judge. reason. You're in right. film for a reason. You can't be impartial. Yeah. You're a little bit of a prima donna, you know, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're a judge doing that, then maybe so. But if you're Nick, mm. you're Chris in film and you want to look good, then you're conscious, fo- uh, your image mm. forward. That's all. You're conscious you of your image. And that, right. my friend, is perfectly acceptable. And, and, and I'll give you an example. I don't know if you've noticed yet. But it uh, just full disclosure, we are uh, recording this on September 1st. Today is the first day of September, and I have uh, decided to pull out my fog of May. Mm. So uh, I don't know if you uh, appreciate it, uh, but and in, I don't know if you have an opinion. It is before Labor Day, but I thought I would pull out one of my fall pieces mm. and uh, the cotton is very soft. I see. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, normally, (laughs) you know, I wouldn't don this attire, but, (laughs) you know, I'm flexible. (laughs) And today. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, It just just, just was speaking to me. It was like, well, well, I'm I'm glad that, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, your clothing speaks to you and, you know, you, you listen. That's excellent. I appreciate that. I do. It is buttery soft, and uh, I'm I'm enjoying the fall. I'm I'm ready to roll out my fall attire. It's, I'm in a good yeah. spot for yeah. that. I was I was wondering about ways you diversify your art. Also, just as some housekeeping, not from the last indie talk with me and Matt, but with the one we had before that. Um, where you sort of spoke about um, sort of you like what you like, you, you know, you're not right. influenced, just like that. What, how do you diversify your art in that mindset? Like if, if it wasn't film, what would be your art of choice? Like what would be, where would you slide investment dollars? Let's say in the art world, Versus maybe where would you put your attention in the art world if we say film's not an option? Yeah, I think, you know, the other one for both of us, you know, that we have a an interest in and it worked in is music, There's, right? Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, when you talk about diversifying, you know, let's say you're not talking about the diversification of the creation of the art, but mm-hmm. the consumption of the art. Mm-hmm. Then for music, how do I diversify you know, I think, again, I think you and I are both in that same 
place where we just, we like a little bit of everything. So long as what we listen to is excellent for one, and then is meaningful for two. Right. So, you know, I find that I listen to all sorts of different things. Uh, one of the things that I'm actually trying to do lately is listen to what's popular, right? Cause normally I don't, <laughs> right? Like it's, especially when it comes to like pop, some of the hip hop and rap of these days, like it's not that appealing. It's so, you know, uh, cookie cutter candy stuff that I don't, but then I'll, what I'll do is I'll grab some of that and then I'll go and look at artists, who, you know, like this one, right. Or people who listen to this also listen to, right. Yeah. Or people in this genre are like, so maybe they're not the ones that are being blasted on the radio for those yeah. who listen to the radio. Yeah. Um, but I'll find the other ones and I usually find some bangers in the other ones. And there are people that, you know, other folks don't know, but then I'm like, okay, now this is, this is music I can get down with. So, and then, you know, again, it's across genres, right? So I don't, you know, listen to one kind of station or one kind of playlist. It's a lot of different things. Uh, but yeah, lately I will say that I have been looking to some of the taste makers, right. Uh, to see what they think, is on top. And then I kind of just branch out from there. But you would, so you would be in the music industry if, if you weren't in film. Yeah. From, or from maybe you art. feel like a little bit, you know, with the scoring and the stuff you have to do around music to make a film and to sort of brand and market it and promote it. Maybe you do feel like you're already kind of blending those two anyway. Well, uh, I think there's always opportunities to blend them. And that's, you know, for me, that's one of the, you know, when you look at a film, you look at all the different pieces of a film that can be exploited. I think that's a piece right there that maybe, you know, from the indie side, people don't think about as much, you know, cause I think on the uh, studio side, they think about it a lot. Like, you know, you want to hear yeah. the soundtrack for whatever film you want to hear the score for whatever film and yeah. that gets sold. But on the indie side, I mean, honestly, I don't know many, you, you might, you know, maybe that's something that I should actually research for independent films, how many scores are out there on iTunes, right? How many soundtracks are out there on iTunes? I don't know. And it's like, it almost feels like if you don't have sort of a label tie in to your soundtrack, then, you know, people in the indie space don't feel justified in releasing it, but the world is wide open. That's right. You can create an album. <laughs> that's it. Create the album art get the licensing together. Maybe that's the obstacle is the licensing, depending on how you got your score created. Um, there, there could be rules and there might be rules around like a lot of times you'll use a sync company or a licensing company that has sort of the, the rights to the licensing for a bunch of right. artists that you don't know, but have great songs. And then that will end up being the score to your film. But that doesn't mean you get to re-release it on their behalf as an album. Right. And I think that's, that's a good way to get a score for your film. It's a good way to get a soundtrack for your film, but that's not a good way to create a new score, right? Like a, a, a not just new, sorry, um, unique and something that you own, right? Yeah. Same thing with the soundtrack. You don't have to go the route that you just mentioned. You know, maybe you actually hire a songwriter, right? You hire a producer to make tracks for the film. Right. Yeah. Um, I was just listening to, again, some music just, I think last night and I didn't realize that, you know, oh, this artist that is also an actress had done the entire soundtrack, you know, for this film. And I was like, that's awesome. That's so smart. Yeah. You know, let's say even if she wasn't in the movie, right. You get this well-known actress who also sings to do the soundtrack. So now yeah. Yeah, even yeah, if yeah. people don't know the actors in the movie, Right. And they have no clue about what this movie is about. What do they know? They know that this well-known person did the entire soundtrack. And then that just the music alone might compel people to watch the movie. It's genius. I mean, that's, that's yeah. something there's so many parts that are exploitable of a film that I think that could be a really cool place for, you know, indie filmmakers to explore. It's, it's kind of like the uh, startup growth hack model. Right. Where okay, yeah. you don't have any users, you don't have uh, you're competing against some some big fish in the marketplace and you basically knock on every celebrity's door, send 100 emails out. And the one that says yes, it ends up being your hero. Right. So you run an ad with that once uh, celebrity in it and then you're off to the races because of 
how much, and we talked about this. Um, I don't know if we talked about this in a group chat. I think we might have in the group chat uh, or in the team chat. Um, this idea that it's a seller's market for celebrity. And it, it, it stays that way. A lot of times there might've been like some lulls where it was a buyer's market for celebrity, but right now it's a seller's market. If you have a name, you can sell the name. It really just depends on, 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 on how you want to use it. And it's, yep. it's, again, it's this integrative idea. It's like, that's a, that's a growth hack idea that comes from uh, startup marketing and branding. And they used it with music on their indie film, uh, you know, or, or someone could use it in that way. Right. And there's a hundred little hacks like that, that could help you get around the fact that you might not, that you might have a deficiency somewhere. And, you know, when you talked about this, um, and when I asked you the question, I was thinking to myself in my head when you said, I think you said the music has to be excellent. And I thought to myself, okay, that might be where we differ. Um, cause I, I think music would be my sort of second thing. I mean, I've been in that business, but to me, I take the Neil Gaiman approach of give me two out of three. You got to, there's three macros in almost every, it's, it's so crazy how consistent it is. There's usually about three macros in everything, uh, uh in the world that you want to You're saying like three points you got to hit is what you're saying. Three macros for every skill. Let me, let me make right. it more clear. Let me be more clear. Uh, <laughs> three macros for every skill. So in, in music, you can be a great musician. You can be a great singer. Or you can be, let's say, um, a great writer. Okay? So those are the three macros of music. If you're great at two and good at the third, that's cool with me. Mm -hmm. Like, Well, I would say that makes it excellent. You know, like that <laughs> that combination well, is... Well, some people good. have all three. <laughs> well, that's and they're that's super probably, dangerous. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's probably... Um, you know, even more just unique, like Stevie, right? Wonder. It's like the, you know, it's like your unicorns, right? Which, yeah, you know, undeniable talent that kind of rises above everything else. Yeah, and I, I think that's with any skill. So I'll take, you know, I'll take two out of three. Well, the indie approach is the same thing. You you might not have celebrities in your movie, but can you have a great score and can you have uh, a great script? Most people will, most people, just like Neil Gaiman, the great author, most people will take two out of three. In any skill you approach, in basketball, can you, you need to dribble, shoot, pass. I'll take two out of the three. I'll take two <laughs> or, out of three. If you're great it? at two, you're going to go to the NBA. Flat out true. If you're great, it's, it's, it's going to go to the NBA. It's kind of funny. I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if that's, if that three works. Cause I'm, you know, I got Rodman in my head. <laughs> I'm like, look, you got to put rebound in there. You know what I'm saying? Like that, you got to put that one in there because that Rodman, I don't think I ever shot. Rebound, rebounding, <laughs> rebounding's not a macro of the game, but at a time, sometimes timing is everything. Robin was no, made for the eighties. He was yeah. made for the eighties and early nineties, man. When things were physical, you had to have a Charles Oakley. You had to have a Dennis Robin. You had to have a Larry Johnson. You had to have somebody, a Bill Lane beer, just somebody who was a shit brick that could, that could, you know, get in a fight and have your back or whatever else. Right. Yep. Robin would be in the NBA today, but not with, not only with the skill set of rebounding, because now the big men run out to the three point line. So the big man's been nullified now. It's a very specialized position now. You can't keep him out there on the floor the whole game. So, yeah, that's a good point, though, that, you know, timing's a key and, and things always change. But that, that whole thing was on my mind, too, because of the promise of NFTs for musicians and other artists. It was seen as like this place where there was, there was a, a fresh land, new green space to go out and harvest and, and growing it big. And you saw the reports this week that, um, open sea, which is the biggest NFT marketplace in the world, uh, that was valued at over $13 billion. I think, uh, is now, uh, 
reporting that their their sales volume dropped by ninety nine percent. Yeah, well, in nine months. Well, you, you remember you and I talked about That's this about wild. what they were doing. Yeah, but you and I talked about this, right? The the folks who had the finances to play in that game were banking on basically their puffery. I mean, th- yeah. th- that's what it was. It was a lot of puffery to invite other people in it. Now, the NFT game is, I think it's still going to exist, right? And it's going to, it'll work. It'll work out. Just not the way that I think they originally intended or originally planned or marketed the whole thing. Like it's still, they're still valuable. NFTs, I think the idea of having that, you know, digital art or digital works that, you know, are unique, you know, it can be tracked and, you know, authenticated. There's still something to that. It's just, it's not going to be this skyrocket to the top type situation that they were trying to create it or make it to be right. Yeah. I think so all I the think bag holders still a, have, a have lost their money. I like, there's no more bag holder money to get, there, you know, yeah, not, and that's what I'm saying. Like it's going to come back more down. $62 million pictures to sell. No, it, it's coming back down. This is now where the lay person gets in and says, okay, well, how do I create value? So for example, Here's a soundtrack to an Oscar winning film, but there's one track that will not be released through the normal market. It will be available as an NFT. Okay. Right. Just that one. And it goes there. It doesn't need to be $300 million for the NFT, right? Maybe it's 10,000 for the NFT and that $10,000 then gets given to, uh, it, it serves as a donation, you know, right. To some organization. Right. That's that, there's something still to that. It's still a digital piece of art that is authenticated to one person who bought it. Right. That that person can sell at any point in time, but it doesn't have to be overinflated. Even at 10,000, maybe that's too much. Maybe it's well, a thousand. I think the, I right? think maybe the it does get auctioned. Of a, of a score or a song, then that's a licensing deal, but it happens on web three. And I think, I think that's the promise. The promise is when will web three and smart contracts be up and, and ready to go versus, sort of this gold rush of trying to buy something just for the sake. Now, everybody has to fall into this bucket, but what's really changed in investing in the last 20 years is that you invest $10 so that you can sell it to someone else for 11. And you're basically guessing, you're saying, I bet I could buy this for $10 and sell it to somebody for 11. Right. Versus, Versus saying, damn, that's beautiful art. I'd be willing to pay $10 for that. Or, or this is an incredible song. I'd be willing to pay, you know, $5 for that song and pay this artist some royalties and a smart contract, you know, anytime I forward the song or anything like that, you know, whatever the deal is. Um, there, you know, I told you about Tim Ferriss selling his, um, his short story for, like 17 ETH or something like that, which at the time was like $33,000 each. <laughs> and, you know, that's, it's a, it's an NFT, but it's also a smart contract kind of thing. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a web three lane that seems like it'll make sense in the future. So the problem is, is you have at least half the market being scammable and being grifty. And then you have the actual dealers themselves. There's a loss of faith there because they've been caught front running the market, manipulating the market, playing both sides. Like there, there's all these weird, they've been hacked. So I think it's really difficult for people to, to figure out, especially if you're lay, like you said, a lay person, yep. it's really difficult for a lay person to say, is this worth $5,000? Is this worth $10,000? I will tell you, having scoured the, the market, those markets a lot, there's a lot of incredible art. You can honest, I mean, really incredible art you can get for $35. Like some of the best stuff and you're like, wow, that's great. And it's 35 bucks. So it's, right. it's only when you're thinking about spending a large chunk of money that it gets really dangerous. And my advice is for indies out there and creatives that want to do NFT and get involved in it deeply, do not just put your song or your art out there as a separate individual item. You create a project, 
build a bunch of artifacts and infrastructure around your project. The more stuff that's around your project, the more stuff you that comes with the actual art that's anchoring this project, the more legitimate your art seems to the buyer. And it's the same as like a film pitch. You pitch to, to qualify yourself uh, while the buyer is looking to disqualify you, like the investor for a film is looking to disqualify you. Well, same thing's happening in that marketplace. Like, well, mm, that looks shady. That looks shady. I think I'll pass. I'll go to the next project. So just make your project look legit by adding so much infrastructure and cool things around your art that anchors it that you, you assage any, you know, concern that it's a, it's, it's a grift. Um, yeah. And I was going to say that also just, you know, uh, in this market, staying away from just trying to create an NFT for the sake of NFT, focus on your art. Yeah. That's the key. Yeah. Really right? have and a then fan determine base. the appropriate platform to sell that art. Right. Don't, don't chase the NFT. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just yeah. create the art and then figure out the appropriate place for it. Yeah. Really have, really have a customer, really have a client. And it's amazing what happens when your focus is the people that you're making the stuff for or the people who, who support you. All of a sudden, you get great reviews. You get a lot more sales. But if you do it, if you focus on yourself and like what's good for you, it, it'll, it'll backfire on you big time. Um, I know that, that you were inspired by what could end up being maybe a curtain call for Serena Williams this week. And... I don't know if the people here have ever, um, I don't know if the people here have ever been told by you that you played a good deal of tennis growing up, tennis and soccer. We've talked about yep. soccer a lot. We've not talked Definitely. about tennis a whole lot. And so you do have a unique appreciation for great tennis. I mean, I do too, but maybe you have it on a different level. So, what are you thinking about Serena uh, and how it ties into to our world? Yeah. So I guess if I were to kind of preface it a little bit or like what the context is, it's the, you know, what can Serena Williams teach filmmakers, right? Or what filmmakers can learn, right? From Serena okay. Williams. And it really comes from something that's very interesting that people are talking about, but filmmakers may not see it as something that's related to them. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to read a little bit about uh, Serena Williams and th this is the, the key thing here. And then I'll tell you why this relates. So the sports star chose to mark the occasion, right? This is her, she's coming back, right? This is likely her last, you know, major tournament. Um, so she's, she's coming back. Right. So that's the occasion that we're talking about here with yeah. a dazzling yeah. black tennis dress worn on Monday at Arthur Ashe stadium in New York. Okay. Um, the look, which is custom made for Serena Williams by Nike and inspired by figure skating costumes features a subtle, okay. The six layered tutu in reference to her six U S open victories. Oh, design. All right. It included wow. a detachable black and gold shimmering train, a pair of diamond embellished Nike court sneakers, a jeweled headband. And I love this, this, the way that they put this and a galaxy of gems stamped into her <laughs> hair, a galaxy of gems, my friend, hold on. Yeah. Even her shoelaces were given the Royal treatment with a set of personalized gold Dubre lace locks adorned with adorned with 400 hand set diamonds from the tennis pros very own jewelry brand serena williams jewelry so these are real diamonds yeah and there's 400 of them okay so <laughs> what, does like, well, how does this... what does this cost exactly but but here's the thing so how does this, what, what, how does this affect filmmakers? Like, why does this make, like, this doesn't seem to tie in, right? Well, it does. Well, I'll tell on, you why. Before you go there, what is, what, okay. is, du, what is a Dublé? Do we need, let's Dublé, Google this. I don't, can we Google yeah, this? Yeah, go <laughs> we Google this I, I, I want to know what a Dublé yeah, is. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look it up, look it up on your, uh, on your phone. I don't want to bend down. Hold on, let me get it. Bend down out of the camera. I don't know how to spell it. Thing. You have the thing in front, like. I know, he was like, what is this? D-U-B-R-E. So. 
Um, let's see. Dubre is a generic term originating at Nike Inc. and dating from the mid-1990s for an ornamental shoelace tag most commonly seen on sneakers. Oh, so that's I, what it I, is. I, I have, have a vision for this which now. The shoelace is threaded. Yeah. Yes, I have a so vision. So that's what she has on her shoe. Okay. Okay. So, sorry. So here's sorry to good. derail us. Continue. No, it's all good. We got to figure out what this Dubre is, right? <laughs> Dubre. So the thing is, <laughs> so the thing is, like when I, as soon as I saw this, I was like, oh, genius, right? Well, why is it genius? Because we came for the spectacle right of yeah. Serena Williams playing in what might be her last set of matches. Right. Yeah. So it's the same thing. You go to the movie theater to see the spectacle of a film. Okay. But what she did was she dropped her own branded content, her own branded product, her own IP inside of the spectacle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not only did she create this thing that is unique, one of a kind, like this dress, this is custom made, right? And it's hers. So once it's, this it's is priceless. over, there you go. So it's priceless. And yet one day, I'm sure it will have a price. There will be a price. <laughs> <laughs> That's so right. Just like the shoes. For the museum right? that puts it behind glass, there will, there will be a price. Exactly. So the same thing with the shoes and then the same thing with the derivatives of the shoes, right? When Nike now produces something that's inspired by the shoes that Serena Williams wore, there's a whole business around that. That's, and she also has, remember these diamonds came from her own brand, Serena Williams jewelry, mm. right? She is selling that product as she plays the game. So when I look at this and I look at film, I look at the same way. We come for the spectacle. We are drawn into this film. We are going to be sitting here for likely 90 minutes. Yeah. Filmmakers have a unique opportunity to create these types of products as well as derivatives of the things that they have in the film. Imagine you get a star. It could be A level. It could be B level, whatever the star is. If yeah. they're considered a star, they're a star, right? You get them and you create a custom outfit right? For that person. It's not just wardrobe, right? You're not just thinking about it as just wardrobe. No, you are creating a custom outfit and you own the rights to that outfit. So yeah. when the film goes out in the world, you can talk about it just as the way that they did there, that it is bedazzled. It is custom fit to this unique individual that everyone knows and loves. And guess what? We're now going to put it up for auction. Mm. Right. These are the types of things that you can do within the context of the spectacle, right? in this case being it could be a film. And I think if filmmakers think about things that way, then there's all these new avenues for monetization for their films. So that's what I said. Serena Williams can definitely teach filmmakers a little bit of something by saying, hey, look, they're coming to see me. So they're going to see me. They're going to see all of me. Right. And there's, there's, you know, options and opportunities in there and she's baked them in. It's pretty smart. I love it. It's very design forward. Right. And brand forward. And the way I see it might slightly differ from the way you described it, but it's in the same world, right? Yep. It's, okay. And it's this idea of, when you're a filmmaker, how important it is to build an image for yourself first before you start talking about your projects. And there are a few people who do this really well that we follow on social and see around. And you start to notice that they get true fans a little faster because people kind of know who they are. They know what to expect and they're actually following their journey and right. the products yeah. they release and the events they go to are sort of just part of that journey. But that's a rarity. The majority of the time, what we see is people marketing, 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 and they haven't really built up a sense of what their purpose is for the marketing. And we know a lot of people like this, actually. Right. Yeah. That are tremendous at marketing. Like they do the whole Gary V 
20 pieces of content a day. They have elaborate sets. Um, They have something funny to say, maybe something dramatic to say. Maybe they provide an opinion, but, uh, you know, political opinion, maybe artistic opinion, whatever it may be. But remember that before I can care about your political opinion, I need to know why you're giving it. That's the branding part. Imagine Ben Shapiro, who who people love to hate or uh, respect the heck out of. He's a great debater. He's very smart. That's for sure. I I don't agree with him (laughs) often. Right. But they know who he is and how he got his legitimacy and why he's doing that. Bill Maher, who I do like a lot and I think is on fire lately, they understand it. This is a stand-up comedian who also went to an Ivy League school and has been doing political satire for three decades at least. Okay, so we know the brand. We can get the message. So to me, that's what I would just say is the reason an outfit that is so bespoke and designed like that works is because we know Serena Williams brand of winning tennis and winning tennis in a very specific way. Right. And being one who breaks from the normal mold in many, many, many ways uh, that are associated with tennis. Right. It's like, did you, I mean, I'm I'm sure many of those listening remember her cat suit that she wore. Everyone refers to it as the cat suit, the skin tight thing that had never been seen before in tennis. And I think there were all, of course, the people who loved it. Then there are many people who hated it because it was so different from what we expect women to wear um, or to be worn in general uh, playing tennis. And it's funny because yes, it is much more, I would say if you wanted to use the word risque versus what some of the men who have deviated have worn. But I will say, I remember a very similar attitude, right. From those, from the onlookers when Andre Agassi wore a black shirt. Yeah. No yeah. one wore black, man. Everybody wore yeah. white. Like that yeah. was the outfit. That was the mold. And Andre Agassi decided to wear black. And it was like, <gasps> how could he? How dare he? Like, this is a game changer. But he changed the game. Like, that was the point, right? right. He changed the game itself. And that's what he was demonstrating, even through his clothes. So, again, as far as the brand is concerned, you're right. This is on brand for her because she's literally changing the nature of the sport with her presence and, of course, with her wins. And what you find out about sports like tennis and sports like golf, uh, for these sports kind of live in the same you know, space, is just how narrow the Overton window is. Hmm. Like it, just takes, it just took Andre Agassi growing his hair out long to break a mold. I mean, imagine. That's right. <laughs> imagine yeah, exactly. That. It just took Serena being black. And winning right. to no. break a mold, it just yeah. took Tiger Woods to win and to be black to break a mold. Yeah. So imagine how narrow the accepted line was, you know, in those given sports. And I think the lesson we can take from that as creatives is, is depending on what niche we pick, what genre we pick, and we found this in indie film ourselves, especially on the executive side, which is okay the box is really narrow here. It really doesn't require a whole lot of difference making to be outside of the acceptable norm. Right. We, we found that just the change in our titles as we approach filmmakers can be disconcerting. Exactly. You got it. Spot on. (laughs) Like really all it takes is us to change our name from producer to advisory producer or uh, advisory consultant or you know, right. <laughs> producing consultant. Like you can, these titles don't mean anything if there's no work to represent it. And we get caught up in that stuff, man. And, and so yep. I think we can all take a lesson two ways from that, which is one, make a brand first, then push your design, your product and, and your thoughts out there. And two, recognize and try to understand what is the width of the Overton window in the, in the area of art, you know, you create inside of, 
You might find that you don't need to change the world to break the mold, that, that you need to just do very little to break the mold, and then you end up changing yeah. the world. Well, we've, gotten, <laughs> remember, we've gotten that advice before. Do the same thing, but different. Yeah. Uh, well, well, that that's an old marketing. That's one of our marketing axioms, you know, to give the listeners some inside baseball. You know, like one of the most foundational marketing, you know, axioms is familiar surprise. It's this idea right. of people don't like surprise, surprise, and they if you give them familiar, familiar, it's kind of boring and and corny. But what they want is a familiar surprise, so something they know but in a different way. And that's how you strike gold. So anything you look at that has really blown up, whether it be a product or a musician or a movie, it's always a familiar surprise. Um, you know, the big Lebowski jumps out at me. Eminem jumps out at me. Yeah, uh, yeah. There are these different things that jump out like, Oh, that was a familiar surprise, but we don't like surprise, surprise. <laughs> and, and that's, that's where, you know, that's where you've gone too far and people aren't ready to go with you there yet. That's where, that's when we say, oh, they're ahead of their time. That's Kanye's Yeezus album when it first dropped. Right. It was ahead. And now all the shit sounds like that. <laughs> and it's like, oh, he was ahead of his time. Well, okay. Right. Yeah. That's probably true. He gave a surprise, surprise instead of familiar surprise, which is what everybody always wants. And there's, there's a million examples of this, even outside the artistic realm. Uh, before we go. We have to talk about uh, movie pass and this their, their reemergence and sort of the timing of this all in the sort of macro industry, sort of in the in the scope of the macro industry, because there is so much going on, and there is an arms race happening underneath our noses. There are a couple of cold wars happening as well underneath our noses. And it's all about where and who is going to own media in 10 years. And how will people consume it? And everyone is running around trying to figure it out first. And we play a role in that too. And some of the things we try to uh, espouse and things we work on behind the curtain and it, and it's, it's a really interesting game of Thrones, if you will, that, that is, that is happening. Uh, by the way, the new series, it's delicious so far. Uh, you enjoy it. There, yeah, that's happening. So here we have theaters coming out of COVID. They've had several blockbusters, but they don't have the traffic density that they're used to having because Hollywood actually isn't producing the number of films for them they used to produce. So it's become a feast and famine game for the theaters. They're scared to go back to the table when they have their sales yearly sales conference and ask maybe for more than 50% of box office or something like that, or more than 51 or 52%. Why? Because now every studio has its own streamer. And, they, and then what they're already doing is they're withholding their best titles I look at Gray Man. I gave Gray Man as an example in our newsletter. That's a movie with Chris Evans and Ryan Gosling that and Anna De Armas. That's a movie that's in the theater every time. Yeah, easy. That, that was a theater film that Netflix sort of hoarded for themselves. And I think if you look at the amount of millions of minutes that movie got watched. There's no way they made more money in subscribers in one week than they would have made in one week in the theater. And it would have been a great experience for us as the consumer. And I feel like the broad consumership gets robbed in this. Of course, you know, we're the bag holder. We're the taxpayer for all these decisions. Uh, and meanwhile, maybe Netflix did get some subscribers out of it. And, and they'll have those subscribers hopefully for a really long time. They, they are one of the streamers that consumers that were surveyed and subscribers that were surveyed said they feel like their service is essential, but we know these things change overnight. And, you know, what is the churn rate of Netflix for someone who's literally signing up just to watch gray man for, for, example? Yeah, we, I think, I don't think that they're gaining. They could be uh, some, right. I don't know that they're gaining at this point. I think their strategy is to keep them. Right. Like that's yeah. the thing Just keep that $20. Like don't lose it. Yeah. Keep you know, it's retention at this point. Right. Yeah. yeah. And fair, you know, fair point. 
Yeah. And there has been a, a huge shift. You know, there's actually some Edison research about, you know, listening habits, right. On podcasts and, and radio and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, pre pandemic, um, people listened to radio and podcast at home 40% of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. During the pandemic, they listened to radio and podcast at home 70% of the time. Right. Right. That's huge. Almost right. Double. And yep. right. And some could say that we're still in it. Right. I mean, there's still, people are still working from home. There's still a lot of concern. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, I mean, it's I'm personally over up. it, but yeah. Yeah. It's eased up. Right. So maybe we're no longer at 70, but what if we you just still went have back to, to have the test on set? So, right. But yeah. what if we went back? What if we're now only at six, we're at 60% at home? Right. That's still 20% more than it was before. So if people are listening there, are they also watching there? And I wonder now, is it, you know, one of those chicken or the egg type situations? Like, are we keeping them at home because of the way we're streaming media? Right. Would we send them back to the theater if we allowed those films that were normally blockbusters to get back out there? Or are we thinking like for Netflix, are they thinking, well, people look at the report, right? Look at this Edison research. Look at this other research. It says that people are watching from home. So why would we put it in the theater if people are watching from home? It's like, well, if put it in the theater, then they would go to the theater. It's I'll like, come so who knows? They're, they're thinking, right? Jurassic, the new Jurassic movie. Um, there's a lot of evidence that shows if your movie's a tentpole movie, I'm not advocating for like Roma to be released in the theater or some of their other. Right. Yeah. You know, like mid budget, low budget movies that are, that are Academy darlings. Although that would be great. I think the so. Whole thing, Again, the you whole create thing experience is that, around it. Yeah. The whole thing is that, the, that it is up to us and our failure to understand the leverage we have as consumers always comes back to bite us in the butt. When theaters are forced to either go bankrupt, which Regal and and Sin uh, Sinmark are likely to do in a couple of weeks, or to maybe take on movies that are mid market, mid budget films, we have to go watch those movies. If they release those in the theater, we have to go support it. And what's interesting is is it will have a dual effect. It'll be a double-edged sword. More of those films budgeted in that range will get made. But what that will do is it'll do what you just said. It'll signal to the streamers that people are going to the theater, and then they'll start releasing their big budget movies back to the theater, and it'll push out the indie. Push those in. out. You can have a question yeah. for you real quick on that note. So it's just so, everybody chasing everybody yeah, and fighting but everybody. Do you think, right, but do you think that the theaters are advocating for themselves? So here, here's why I asked the question. Why am I not seeing PSAs from the theaters saying, hey, remember me? Well, they play them we, in the theater, which is, which is crazy because you have to be at the already. theater to see it. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so like, before every why film, you'll have Nicole that? Kidman come on and say, and this movie's great in the theater. Right, right. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, I'm already here. I'm, I'm already I'm a here. believer. You're preaching to the choir. Exactly. So why am I not seeing them advocating for themselves in so many different ways to say, guys, again, remember me? We were friends. Like we're not only friends, we're family, right? I, Cause I brought, we, we brought family together. We brought friends together. We created an experience that you literally cannot have at home. It yeah. is impossible. Can you watch the movie at home? Yes. Can you have the big screen and a good sound? Yes. Will it mimic, right? Exactly. The theater experience. No, it won't because the theater experience is also usually coupled with walking to the theater. Mm -hmm. looking at all of those posters on the wall and imagining what you might want to see next time and talking about it with your friends Elbow or your the family to the left of you. So you can get to the popcorn butter. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There's the movie that happens before, or I mean, see the movie, the dinner that happens before or after the movie, right? There's this whole experience. It's a night out, right? It's getting away from your house. There's something to that. Right. Yeah. It's like my wife, when we're in the house, she's like, yeah, I can't watch anything on the main level of the house because I just want to clean this and pick up because that thing is dirty and I want to clean that. And she's distracted. 
right? But we can get her out and you can be out with the family and enjoy without the distractions. You can't get that at home. Yeah. And I just don't understand why they are not begging our attention and asking us to save them. What's happening? Yeah, like only in a theater can you like uh, snap awake a guy named Chester who's high on mescaline to let him know there's no ice in the damn Coke machine. Come on, man. <laughs> like you, that is a theater experience. You know what I mean? Chester of all names. You know, you miss out. You miss the, only the theater can you miss the first five minutes of a movie involuntarily. That. Right. <laughs> <laughs> is a theater only experience. Yeah, and that, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and enter Movie Pass, who is back. Black owned business, by the way. I don't know if people yep. know that. Minority owned business. And I got on their waiting list. Okay. Full disclosure, I'm putting myself out there. I am on the Movie Pass waiting list, and I was a Movie Pass customer before. Now, here's what's interesting about it. I knew it was too good to be true when I signed up the last time. Yeah. <laughs> I was riding but that flaming meteor, meteor down yep. and knowing that we better watch as many movies as we can right now. Now, that made them go bankrupt faster. But that was the whole idea. It was like you knew it, you knew it was it – was, something was up. Yep. Right? If you can, if you can verify a, a Monet painting – is real and you've got it at a yard sale, you get the heck out of there. <laughs> right. You don't small talk. You're not talking about, Hey, right. what, what, what calls you to have a yard sale? Like, you know, right. no, yeah. oh, Monet for 10 bucks. Okay. Go and on. you're out of there fast. So that's what we were doing. We were going to see movies all the time and their gamble. This is, this is why you can't use quackery psychology to build your business. You can't just like guess. And I see so many entrepreneurs that just like, oh, I just guess. And I, I think this is how I feel like people don't say I feel like people do this. You have to know. You have right. to have insight into action. So him and his co-founder originally just assumed that people had, this is pre-pandemic, that people had too much stuff to do to watch more than three movies a month. But when you tell them they can watch as many movies as they want, many for movies free, as they want <laughs> for or for one price, ten bucks, suddenly they have time. Right. Time on time on time. I knew people that were watching ten plus movies a month. Wow. And then they tried to slowly pull things back. Well, you can't watch the first release movies because they're they're holding the bag for that. You know. Right. Yep. It's like uh, PayPal before they were monetized. Like anytime somebody would do something fraudulent, they still held the bag for the transaction at the bank, right. but they weren't making any money on the transaction, no middleman money. So that, that's kind of what was happening. Well, anyway, they're back and they have a bunch of different tactics. And I wanted to bring this up because it's a callback, not only to our ongoing theater chat where they could come in and play DSS Machina or White Knight to the theater chain system by bringing people back to the system, but they're also using our friends over there. Uh, I can forget where their home base is, but Keros, uh, the, the AI software company that is going to scan your eyeballs and uh, see how many Let's emotions. Test your sentiment. Yeah. You know, <laughs> test your sentiment, sentiment analysis, <laughs> test, test your laughter, test your disgust. And then, we talked about this. They give the information back to the filmmaker and the editor so they can edit a better movie. And it's all very on the up and up, Nick. You don't need to worry about your privacy here, Nick. You don't need to be creeped out. I can see you creeped <laughs> out. You don't need to worry about this. These guys are smarter than us, and they have it mm. under control. And yeah, they're going to make sure that you <laughs> see course. the best movie that you can possibly see. And yep, it's about amazing. looking at your eyes. Well, yeah. Movie Pass will pay for itself because they have integrated this technology into their app. And if you agree, now I do give them credit for just admitting it versus like right. doing this behind our backs. If you agree to let the app scan your eyeballs, be looking at you basically while you watch a movie, <laughs> they will give you money to watch movies for free. Right. So now why are they scanning your eyeballs for this one? It's because of the ads, correct? Maybe the ads could right. be. Right, so they're going to scan. Be, they, they could also sell this data back 
to that very same customer that wants to know which movies work, which moments work. This exactly. is the, so this, so is, much. this is this is the new this is the new era of film screening. This is the new thing. It's no longer Yeah, but it's also the new era it's, it's of It's no longer test screening technology. 20 people you know in a theater. It's Yeah, and and it's it's all invasive, right? And the thing is is that is this idea that I, they can present you with value but there's an underlying it's not necessarily nefarious in that they want to do something you know, have ill 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 means, I guess you could say but they've got other intentions behind the use of that data. Right. And yeah. that's the part it's like, no, we're going to, it's, it's like the whole thing with every search engine website, whatever that gives you the option for them to either collect your data or not. Right. And yeah. what do they come to you with? They come to you with the value statement that says custom ads. Mm -hmm. If you turn this tracking off, you won't get custom ads. You will get random garbage ads that don't have anything to do with you and will feel like spam. But if you allow us to track you across all of your websites and across all of your social, you'll get things that are customized just for you. Oh, of course. <laughs> Why would I want garbage ads? I'm going to click the button that says, yes, track me, please. Or and the then I get all the, button, the ad is... goodness. Exactly. And they like, give you all the options. Cookie so, already. Damn it. <laughs> right. Every time so, I come here, you ask me for my right. cookie. Cookie, right. You can <laughs> have my cookie. Right. So the thing is, that's what they're doing with this. They're going to say, you will get a better experience if you allow us to track your eye movement. And then you give away much more than you could have ever imagined. Now, what's interesting, uh, there is, um, it's a series, I guess it's called The World according to Jeff Goldblum mm -hmm. on Netflix. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Netflix. I think and one, yeah. And I'm trying you know, I'm like, Oh, I'm trying to picture it. And in one of the episodes, they talk about shoe design. And I do believe this was, you know, an Adidas shoe, of course, you know, mm -hmm. big fan of yep. Adidas, fan uh, an Adidas yeah. shoe. And they showed the same technology and they said that this is how they determine how people that they're making the shoes for, um, how, how they are reacting to the shoe and they're basically following the pattern of the eye and they're following the pattern of the face. So basically as they give you a set of glasses to wear and say, look at the shoe and based off of that, they can understand your sentiment around the shoe. So this is a technology that's already being used in a number of different ways, but again, to determine that sentiment. Yes. A lot of applications. So that application right? is not only to the quality of a film, but it might be to the content of that film. So did you react positively or negatively to the interracial couple that showed up on the screen? Yeah. Right. Did you react positively or negatively to the um, same sex couple that showed up on the screen? Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of things that can be determined right or analyzed by this type of data and you know i just i throw up the flag and i just say hey you know i would i'm not gonna do it and i'm personally I would, not gonna do it either um, yeah be wary i'm a little wary Buyer beware. because there isn't a, a real track record for well it's a consumer product you know i don't want to be a hypocrite like like i have done 23 and me right that's pretty personal but yep. when I started with them, their distinct market purpose was health and giving you, to me, you got a lot more than they got. Okay. Now that, that can flip in time. Right. But at the time, and this was pre-merger or pre-acquisition of that company, now I feel a little bit less happy about it. I feel a little bit more concerned. But back then... Here's a company that's doing research that's literally saving people's lives if you're willing right. to spit into a colander and like get your DNA mapped or whatever. And it's like a small miracle. And you can work with your physician. There was all these big upsides I had when I was sort of, sort of an early adopter to that. But if they were saying, hey, give us your DNA, and if you, uh, uh, what, if you do, uh, you'll get free passes to a movie. And to give your DNA, you just need to watch this movie. That would be different. It would be like a consumer... <laughs> kind of thing. And yes. so I'm not really being a hypocrite. I'm just saying 
there, there's a lack of seriousness to movie pass where your actual retina scan is kind of super serious. They can sell that data right. to a government and agency will. if they, and if they, they get into a bind. Yeah. So we, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm happy to pay. I think matter of fact, artists deserve the money, frankly. Yeah. Like I don't even let people on the sidewalk give me their CD. I buy it from them. Like right. I don't want any problems anyway. Like to come back later, I'm I'm like that. I think like that. I'm like, hey, I bought your music, man. Yeah, right. I wouldn't want the people you gave it to, <laughs> or yeah. I bought your movie or whatever it is. So we're we're in the clear. We don't owe each other anything. We're good to go. Um, that's just that's just the way I feel. But I am excited about it. They have a new tiered program. I think that's going to be great. It's going to get people to the theaters, and it might solve a few problems. There'll still be the TV arms race and Cold War going on where cable's going to follow uh, the consumers into streaming spaces and do fast TV and all that, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, but for the movie part of it, Movie Pass might get to play White Knight here if they, if they play their hand correctly. They're just not getting my retina scan. That's all. You're right. Yeah. So we shall see, my friend. We shall see how it plays times out. Ahead. <laughs> That's it. We'll keep this audience posted uh, all the, uh, all along the, the path. Uh, and um, it's probably a saga that will continue on for the next 12 months. And you know, speaking of Adidas, by the way, just as a quick side note, uh, I don't know if you saw that Kanye West said that uh, he saved Adidas and Gap from bankruptcy. Uh, single-handedly and mm. uh, and now that they are reneging on their part of the deals to open up brick and mortar Yeezy stores he has leveraged social media to open up stores all across the world and I would say that's genius and that's another case of he already has his brand and so that's therefore right. he can go out and make a post like that and have a million people comment and respond saying, I can open a store for you in my town. Here we go. And if you don't have a brand and you do that, um, and we've experienced this the hard way, even ourselves, you, know, you get like five, 10 people. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Cause they're like, well, why are we doing this? Like, I don't even yeah. know, like, how does this connect to you? Right. So that brand piece is really important. Um, yep. Nick, this has yeah. been an absolute blast. And we touched on some pretty heady topics today. We, Probably should do like a, like a marathon indie talk one day that's like four or five hours long. And see if <laughs> Man, we can, no. Yeah, we, we have to walk, take breaks, bathroom breaks, drink breaks. You know, well, I'll say this. If we that's do fine. one of those. No, no, no. If we do one of those, the, the drink should be definitely in, in the appropriate size glass. I would have to wear something I could sweat in. I think I would be. Well, yeah, that's what I'm I think if I finished a bottle of alcohol. And was talking to you the whole time, I'd be drenched. You're right. <laughs> I'd be covered in sweat. I think I would be. And tears. And I'm tears. sure. Sweat and tears. tears of laughter, you know, that's just to be dripping down. But anyway, yeah, this is great, dude. It's great to be back on. You know, I know there was a, like you said, there was a hiatus. I'm super happy to be back. This is so much fun. You know, I'm, I'm glad to be here doing this with you, man. It's, it's pretty awesome. And again, uh, since, you know, I don't think there has been an episode yet that has acknowledged it. Happy birthday, brother. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. The celebration continues. Yes, it does. Um, the fire rises. <laughs> and Very good. Uh, I'll let you, I'll let you know when it, when it all ends, but it's, it's been really wonderful. And, and in all seriousness, the post you made was really sweet and everyone replying under that and DMing. I love you guys. You guys are really amazing. And I didn't know I had that many friends. So that meant the world to me. So I really, really appreciate it. And if you want to continue to send me birthday wishes or tell us anything, you can do that very easily at underscore bonsai creative. That's on Instagram and on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook and TikTok at bonsai creative. And you can reach out to me directly on Twitter by searching for Christopher Barkley or Flame in Your Heart. You can reach out to Nick by emailing him at nick at bonsai.film. He would love to get feedback and uh, questions about uh, his vacationing life, his shaving habits, all that stuff, his workout <laughs> regimen, uh, et cetera. And, um, of course, for all things bonsai, two quick resources 
www.bonsai.film, that's B-O-N-S-A-I dot F-I-L-M. And then the same address except forward slash, is it subscribe now, Nick? You got it. So bonsai.film forward slash subscribe, and that'll get you signed up to our bi-weekly newsletter. So two editions per month. We never spam you. We never sell any of your stuff. And uh, all we want to do is give you a different take on the indie film industry that you're not going to get from some of the other newsletters out there. Nick, do you mind leaving us with the credo? Oh, I never mind. That's a, you see what you, play on words, right? <laughs> As always, I call that. Be better, be creative, be engaged. And thank you for listening. Nick, talk to you soon. Yes, man, we'll do it again. All right, brother. No, right, man, take it easy. Yep, peace. You too. Hey, gang, one more thing before you go. I want to talk to you about Indie Insights. Indie Insights is our bi-weekly newsletter and love note to the film industry, movies, and the creatives that make them, not to mention you, our esteemed listeners. Inside, you'll find curated industry trends, articles, exclusive commentary, and underappreciated films from filmmakers like you worldwide. And the best part is that it's completely free. So join today at www.bonsai.film. It just takes a few seconds, and once you sign up, you'll get the very next newsletter. It's that simple. Go to www.banzai.film to get Indie Insights, our bi-weekly newsletter, and join a network of film creatives like yourself. And don't worry, we'll never sell your information or spam you with a bunch of nonsense emails. Just the bi-weekly film industry goodness you need. And if you ever tire of Indie Insights, we hope not. But if you do, simply unsubscribe. No gimmicks, no games. So, one more time, go to www.bonsai.film to get Indie Insights for free. And thank you for listening. <laughs>